Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with hopefully a short video. This is a Sinclair Spectrum, ZX Spectrum, plus three, as you can see, uh, 128K, it's got the three inch floppy disk drive. So this was the last uh, Spectrum that was released and it was manufactured by Amstrad. Hence why they went with the same uh, CF2 disk drives they used in the CPC range there. So this is the first uh, one of these I've looked at on my channel. Uh, my friend Trevor had one of these and uh, I did service one or two of these back in the day. You can see it's working at the moment, very fuzzy picture, I'm connected via RF. I could go and get my AV leads out for this, it's not that important for what we're doing here, I just need to swap the drive belt. So this belongs to Adam, the guy who I, you know, I sold that ZX uh, Spectrum to and then I fixed it and sent it back. and. Helped him with a few issues and stuff with that, so uh, yeah, he made contact uh, with me and said, uh, I've got a plus three, would you mind swapping the belt out? And then did explain to him, it's a fairly straightforward process, and pointed him towards uh, the CPC video actually, the 6128, because it's identical, the drive's identical. Um, the only difference is obviously the screws are slightly different places underneath, but that's it. So yeah, it should be short and sweet, but whilst we're in there, we'll have a quick look at the motherboard, I'll point out what, what one or two chips are and stuff. So we've got one screw there, one down here, one up there, and then one in either corner here. Those screws are all the same length. And we have exactly the same uh, mounts here, which is no surprise because it's the same drive as on the 6128. A couple of screws here, look, we just hold the drive into position. Now there's going to be a ribbon in here for the keyboard. I'm not sure which end it's going to be. Let's just uh, tilt this up so we can have a look. Yeah, it's down here just like on the 6128. And just like on the 6128, you can uh, just hinge it there like that and uh, just leave it rested against something. I use a you know a table nearby, so it's very easy just to rest that that way up. And if you saw the garbage to uh, gem video I did on that uh, plus two, I think it was plus two B, could have been, uh, might have been an A, no, I think it was a B. Um, you'll notice that the everything's the same. You've got the gate, same gate ray there, the ram down here for, um, 32k RAM chips there to give you 128k. We've got uh, the floppy controller there, that's different. That's the Z80. And then we've got two ROMs here. I'm guessing as a consequence of this having um, a floppy drive, it's going to have um, slightly different uh, you know, stuff going on there with BASIC. I think that's the data separator actually. The part number there looks very, very similar, if not identical, to the one on the 6128. And we've got the video encoder here, TEA2000. We've got a 74HC chip here. There's your AY sound chip. And we've got a 1488 and a 1489, your serial transmitter and receiver pairs here. Connected to these, I think, actually, on that. And then just some more 74 series stuff over here by the looks of things. They're kind of going to be sort of CMOS compatible, probably. That looks like an MC1376P. I'm not sure what that is. I was kind of expecting a 555 or something on here for the reset, but it might be done subtly differently on this. And you can see the motherboard is an issue too, and you've got your connector here that goes, you know, the cable to the IDC cable to the back of the floppy drive there. So the floppy drive looks very clean. Just look at that head. That looks immaculate. That's hardly had any use, that. That is immaculate in there. There's not been a bit of dust on it. There is, however, a lot of dullness to these expansion connectors here, so I will clean those up with the uh, fiberglass pen, I think, and uh, some IPA and a cotton bud. Anyway, we're here for the drive initially, so let's just get the uh, screws out of here. I think that might be it, actually. Is there something else there holding it? Or is it? No, it's just this cable grip here. Look for this cable. Let's just uh, twist that that way to release that cable, and then the drive yeah, should come out. So let's uh, just pull the cable off the back here. They are quite stiff though, so there we go. Disconnect the uh, power JST, there we go. And let's take this back over to the mat and uh, swap the belt out. Hopefully it is just the belt. We'll clean the uh, head while we're there as well. Single head on these, you just get like a sponge pad on the top side there, look. The nice thing with this, it's one of the later drives and it's got a solid back there, look. So that's not going to suffer from the problem that um, some of the CPC ones do where you know constant movement of the head and this bar you know having a bit of flexibility held by a point there means that the metal point starts to fatigue and give way here so uh, I would think that these drives are perhaps more reliable. 
So if you've seen the 6128 repair I did, you'll know that these are really simple to do. I'm sorry we're covering old ground, it is the same drive, you can see the wash look, it's just sat there, so do not lose those washers, they're important to stop the uh, screw from you know coming loose basically. Uh, anyway, we'll just undo the screws that hold this PCB into the drive chassis. This one's a smaller one here, can you see this? Again, that's got a washer I think. Yeah. I think that's it for the screws, so I think the board should start to move. What we really need to do here now is disconnect one or two of these connectors. Let's just uh, see if we can grab that one, gently pull it out. So we'll see if we can disconnect this connector here. This is for the head I think. If we just get a screwdriver at the point where the connector goes, there you go, into the thing. We can sort of pull it up and out like that. It's better to do that rather than pulling the wires because you may detach the wires from the uh, thing. And if we just uh, tilt it this way, let's just have a look. Yeah, we could do with doing the one over this side, I think, here for the step motor. There's the drive pin. There's the uh, right protect pin you heard fall out there. I think the easy thing to do here is just to literally pull the wire out of this metal thing. Can you see it? You can bend it like that, and then that wire comes out of there, which uh, just gives you a little bit of flexibility here, look. You could almost replace it like that. You can see here, look, there's the belt. Can you see it's just wrapped around the motor? It's broken and then just spilled up around the motor. So this would be far easier if I could just disconnect that there. The problem I'm having is just getting a grip on it. It's so small. Let's just try and pull it by its wires. Feels like that's glued in or something to be honest. So I'll try doing the same thing here, I'll just try and get onto the gap. Yeah, there we go. That should allow us just a little bit more movement with the board now. And if we bend this little metal clip out of the way here, you can just fold them back down afterwards, we'll tuck the wire back in there after. It just, again, just gives us a little bit more uh, room to manoeuvre, there we go. So the board is still held in place by wires, but you can see you can just pull this out of the way here. Just gives us a little bit of room to work with here, so we can just sort of just pull this off here and pull it out. It's all sticky and disintegrated that rubber. Ugh. So we've got some IPA on a cotton bud here, and I'm just going to rotate this as I press the cotton bud against it and move the cotton bud. Can you see the black remnants of the rubber coming off there? It's like dissolved and stuck on the thing there. So I'll do this with a few different cotton buds. Let's just use the dry end. There's probably still some more on it. I think you could use acetone for something like this. Some people, uh, yeah, some people use acetone. Uh, anyway, that's clean now. I can see it. There might still be a little bit of residue on it, which is why I'm still wiping over it, but I think majority of that is off, actually. Yeah, you can see the cotton bud is looking a lot cleaner. There's barely anything on that now. And if we use the dry end again, just to make sure it's uh, super clean and dry. And we'll just clean around the wider area slightly there, just in case that rubber has left any residue on the main part of the chassis. But hopefully you can see there the surface of it, all the rubber has gone off it. So the other place we need to do this is this main black wheel in here, can you see this? So this is quite fiddly to get to unless you disconnect the other wires. And I'll show you, you could disconnect this here and then just pull it out, that would give you a bit of freedom with the drive. And there's also, can you see an orange and a yellow wire down there? Those are attached to the little PCB below, but if you unscrew those things it could be a bit fiddly to get it back on. And from my experience, you don't tend to need to, as long as you don't stretch this too far and damage the wires, you can literally, you know, look down the cavity there, get a cotton bud, and with a little bit of work. So you can just about see here, I've got a cotton bud with some IPA and I'm just uh, rotating the wheel. Just give it a rub there, clean up the surface of that. You can see just a little bit of dirt come off that. 
And here's our replacement belt that he provided that came from DataSurf. So uh, yeah, they seem to be the main people that supply these belts. I've seen loads of belts like this come from them. So the difficulty we'll have here, I think that other driver looked at was a little bit easier. You could move the board out of the way enough to be able to get the belt, but you can see I can, but you can see I'll just be able to you know dangle the belt down the cavity there until we get over the other side of the wheel. Hang on. And once you've hooked it on there like that, you can literally just pull it over here. Try to let it elastic key sort of thing out. Hang on. Uh, this is where you need to make sure it's straight. Can you see this? You see we've got a little bend here. It's twisted on that side. So you can see what I'm doing here. I've just got the belt down there and I've hooked it onto the wheel. You know, just uh, put it over it and hooked it on and then we'll just slide it up and over the motor thing there. That's it. Can you see? It's nice and straight. It's straight here and it's straight here. What you could do at that stage is just carefully rotate it and just make sure it stays nice and straight as you rotate it. But that's on. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. That is on. Dead easy. And that really is it. And just inspect to make sure you've not damaged any of the wires from pulling it and stuff, and we haven't. Uh, so what we can do now is rotate this back around this way. Let's uh, just put the head wire back under there like that and uh, just carefully bend we'll just carefully bend that little clip down there to hold that wire that's holding it in place do the same thing on the wire here can you see just pull it under there I need two hands to do this there you go can you see that little clip is holding the wire down and then we just need to you know make sure your LED goes back in here you know the board has to sort of go in that way Put it onto its screw mount positions. Let's search uh, carefully. Reconnect this. Just push that in like that. So on this side here, our connector's just got stuck under there. So let's just pull that out a sec, and we need to push that back into position there like that that's it yep that's on and just our three screws but before we do that we need to get this in now this bit is easier if you use some thin nose pliers like this can you see there there's a little hole not the one for the screw but one on the actual chassis and if you're struggling with the uh, pliers like I am use a magnetic tip screwdriver because you will see well as long as you don't stick it to the chassis yeah, look at that. That was really easy. Can you see that? It's going up and down. So I'll put it down, pull the screwdriver away so it says stays in the hole. Can you see it down there, that little thing? And then put the PCB flat. So I'll start with a little tiny one which went there. And the larger one with its washer. And the other larger one with its washer. Actually, I've just realised the types of washer on these are different. One's got a flat washer, one's got like a, a split, you know, it's got like little bits coming out of it. And the little bits coming out of it went on the side with the ground, actually. You know, you can see this is uh, ground in the chassis. That's better. They're the same size screws, just got a different washer. And that's it, we can uh, stick it back in the plus string, give it a test, but before we do that we'll clean the head. So some 99% uh, IPA, just lift the uh, sponge thing there and just uh, rub on the head a little bit like that. Some people think you've got to be really soft on heads, you don't want to warp them out of position, but you've got to be pressing enough to get that squeaky noise to, in order to get any contaminants actually off the surface, they won't just always come off with a gentle rub uh, and we'll clean around the wider area but that head looks brand new it does the hole around it you know it looks like it's just come from a factory it's incredible how good condition that is and I think while we're here we'll clean off this old grease look at that it's gone waxy um, and we'll get some molly coat onto there if you press onto this hard enough you can see it rotates which just helps you move the uh, mechanism out of the way to get further on the bar and stuff you know so I'll just use uh, one more cotton bud there and we'll just get some uh, molly coat onto that
I'm going to get quite a lot on there and then we'll just get the head moving around. The other thing you might want to do is get some on the, the rails there that it slides up and down. You can see I've wiped those already but if we just get a little bit on there let's just try and rotate this around. I can always stick a bit more on in a minute because you end up wiping it off as you do that. We'll get a little bit on this side down here. Just clean it off the wider area there. You don't want it all over the place. Yeah, so you can see we can get some on that uh, bit of that bar there as well. That should just assist with the movement, and we'll just get a little bit more on there before we go and test it. Now we'll just get some more on there. I'm not bothered about having a bit too much there like that, because as it goes up and down, that will. Uh, distribute and stuff. I can always wipe it up after I've had a bit of a test of it. So let's go and connect it up to the plus three and see if it works. So I'll connect the uh, IDC up first, making sure we get that the right way around and the, there are two rows there, make sure it's properly aligned and the power and then if we just uh, sit this back into position here. Now it's kindly provided three different uh, discs here uh, one of them, can you see this? The shield on there has come off on that, so I'm not sure what's happened to that in the past. Anyway, it's got uh, Cobra, Mutants, Green Beret, other side, short circuit, great escape. Let's, uh, let's just try that, let's put that in. Yeah, that disc is not working at the moment. I think I know what's going on here, I've seen this before, let me just switch it off. So I've disconnected the power. Can you see we're right up against the track zero sensor here, so as soon as you switch it on, it's already past track zero, which means it's act. You know the correct track zero alignment is is not going on. If you see what I mean, it's it's looking at the wrong place. So uh, if we just move this up, I'm not explaining that very well. I'll perhaps uh, show you what I mean in a minute with a diagram. If we just carefully rotate this, I'm using this because I don't want to wipe off all the grease. If we just carefully rotate it past the sensor like that. So this little plastic arm here now is not breaking the beam of light there. So I'll try that same disc with the same side that I've just tested. And let's try it again. Nope, it's not seeing that disc, is it? So I'll try another disc. That's working. So I think he's got a uh, bad disc here, actually. Yeah, you can see that's loading, look. Sweet. So I think this plus three is probably suffering from the distorted audio issue you get. Uh, let's just press return. So I'm loading it again here just so you can actually see the operation of the uh, head. I know you can't actually see the head, you can see that top part that corresponds with it here, the sponge that holds the top side, just holds the disc down. You see, look, track, track. So yeah. It's fine. I'm glad I included a couple of discs. I could have gone around for ages messing around with that one disc. So I might try this disc again. We'll maybe try the other side. I don't know. Feels like it's rotating okay. Well, there's the odd bit of dirt. Can you see that there? Looks a little bit dirt and dirty in there. And that's one of the problems where you you know the shield is not here protecting it. Because what's supposed to happen is you pull this thing here. In fact, that's not even moving, is it? That's why it's not working. It's reading that, yeah? That's the problem with this disc, just watch. Push this, that is not moving. So I suspect if we put the disc that way up, this side, it may well read, unless that bit of metal there is going to interfere. I managed to get this to go all the way back on one side, can you see that? Hang on, one side's working now, one isn't I think. Yeah, look at this side here. Now that is working, and it's exposing it there, but this side is a problem still because the metal thing in there is just flapping in the breeze, look. If I could move it out of the way, oh there you go, you can tilt it out of the way, let's try that. Hang on, it's come back again. Yeah, you can see how easy that is for that to float back into position. But if that does slow into position, the bit here blocks as well. I'm being careful not to get this too near the disc by the way because it's uh, magnetic. Um, the problem there is it blocks the hole. So this is why this disc wasn't working on either side. 
If we could just, I don't know, what can we do about it? Because you can't get in it. You can't get in it. You'd have to prise this apart. And it's kind of glued, so I don't want to do that. I'll let Adam know there's a weird issue with this. I don't know whether it's happened in transit or what, but can you see that? I'm pulling it down there like it's not moving, which would mean the other side of the disc wouldn't work, even if that does open on that side. Let's try Manchester United. Yeah, that's uh, loaded the menu. I'll just use one for English. Yeah, you can see it loading away there. Now it did start there, and then I think it maybe it's bombed. So maybe this disc is not good either. There might be a dry joint on that power supply connector, actually. I'll check that in a minute. So you can see we get the menu up there. English. Oh, RF is terrible. Yeah, that's loaded this time. Sounds terrible. Even though I'm using RF, the audio is pants, absolutely pants. And I think that this is one of the uh, Rev 3s that needs the audio mod. I think all the Rev 3s maybe do, I'm not sure. Uh, they may have corrected it at some point, but this one definitely does. I've got headphones plugged in here. I might do a recording of that later. It sounds like not all the channels are coming through there, and that it's loose, that. So I'll get the board out, we'll inspect the underneath of there, but I think we're going to need to swap a load of resistors on here to fix the audio. I'll speak to Adam and see if he's uh, happy to pay for those resistors. I don't mind doing it for nothing. Um, I obviously need to go and order them up. So let's get the uh, ribbons out here. So I'm just going to grab that and carefully pull it up. There we go, that's one. And do the same with this one here. Grab it and pull it straight up. There we go. You can move the keyboard out of the way now. And um, we'll just get all these screws out that hold the board in place. I need to do this to clean the board up, inspect underneath the board, certainly the back where the uh, connector goes for the uh, audio. And obviously we want to clean these edge connectors up as well, I wouldn't want to do that in the case. Well you can't get under the thing properly to do it, so anyway, let's just uh, move those things out of the way. The board should now come out now I think, there we go. So we'll clean these connectors up, give the board a quick clean, and then I'm just going to reassemble it. I've let Adam know about uh, the audio, that I think it uh, probably should have the audio mod done to it, which will mean ordering uh, several different resistor sizes and, and swapping those resistors on the board there. Uh, you can see, actually, most of this is just coming off here. It's just a little bit of light oxidisation on there. These fiberglass bristles get into my fingers. They really annoy me. Ow, I can feel it now just from leaning there. These are nowhere near as bad as those uh, CPCs were. Or probably the plus two that I looked at. And a little bit of IPA. We'll clean the wider PCB here while we're at it, I think. Because there's a lot of exposed area here. You can see, you know, it's a Sinclair product, Amstrad, with a manufacturer at this point in time for the, these models, the Bus 3. So, Adam gave me permission to open this disc and try and fix it. Because uh, it's beyond, you know, without that. Because if the shutter opens on one side, here, that hole, it doesn't open on the other. You know, this thing is just floating around in there. Can you see that? So, we've got no choice. It's either that or it's game over for this uh, disc. So, I'm going to try and carefully prise this open. I don't know if someone's tried this before, because can you see there in the light? There's like a little gap there. So, I don't know. It might be a good place to try and open it. What you don't want to do is try and prise this open with something that's magnetic, like a screwdriver. What I don't want to do is gouge right in there and damage the disc. I just need to prise it at a corner or something here. I don't know. Very difficult. See, if we open it like this, we won't damage the label. So I'm sorry it's going dark. You can see here, I just managed to prise it there and it has started to separate. 
just a little bit but this as obviously has got trapped now so I need to go the whole way with this I think now to try and recover this it's, you know I can't give up halfway but it has started to separate now I'm actually going to get my plastic spudging tools here to try and avoid damaging this but you can see separating there it's just stuck on the corners if I can just get one side off there's a chance I might be able to solve this oh look it's come across part there I'll try and do the same with the opposite side oh this hasn't got the thing on it has it that's what made that side easier because it had that thing in the middle oh there's a gap there look separate a little bit in the middle up oh, and there see that and there might never work again afterwards but it doesn't work now so if we can recover this that's uh, great so lighting it very bad here you can see the little uh, right protector tabs have just fallen out as it started to separate look there you go it's kind of clipped it's clipped together which is good Need to try and I don't know work out what's holding on the bottom here now. I hope there's no screws under there. I don't want that to go on the disc. It's kind of pressing on the disc there. Like. Try and get these things out. Right, that's the disc. That's that side is so that's si the side that's facing up there is the bit that goes here. Let's just try and remember that. Can we get those metal things out? Yeah, there's a bit of plastic there, just a little bit. In theory, if I can get rid of the metal bits, I could actually uh, solve this because I don't think I'm going to get the metal things back in. Something's probably broke off somewhere on the inside. Let's just get that metal bit out if we can because then we can just put the disc back in and seal it up and we may be done finally I got in there this spring thing is not going back in these aren't going back in there's gonna be no dust cover for this but it will at least work hopefully so let's just uh, see if that's gonna fit back together and I think the answer is yes so as I say this went up at the top where the label is so it wants to go this way up, let's just inspect that. That's very delicate. Just blow any dust off it. Yeah, I don't see any marks or anything on that. So let's just uh, put this back in. Right in the centre. There, I think, is that right? Yep. Yeah. And then just try and clip it back together. Yeah, it's going to need a bit of glue, I think. Maybe a little, a little drip of super glue in the top corners, not near the disc here, but right in the corners. And then maybe hold it this way up, let it dry that way up, so the vapors go upwards, not into the actual cavity. So yeah, it's lost its uh, protective cover there, but that might just solve it. Oh yes, it's working. It's fuzzy as anything that picture, and the sound is awful. Let me just reset it. If I can find the reset button, I don't know where it is, isn't it? It's on the side, isn't it? And uh, press return on the menu, on loader, and you'll see it loads and you get many free games. So we've tested short circuit. Let me test the next one. I obviously want to flip the disc over and test the games on the other side. It's a good disc, this, so uh, it'd be good if uh, most of these games work. Even if a few of them work, it's better than nothing. The RF signal is terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, so let's try the Great Escape. I'll just cut to these uh, having loaded. Yeah, so the Great Escape doesn't seem to be working. I'll cycle the power, let's try the other game. Yeah, only short circuit worked on the other side, but as you can see, Cobra's loaded alright. That might be the side that was lacking the shutter, where the shutter was sliding around, it was rubbing on the disc. 
Okay, well, we'll try the games on this side. This seems alright. Let's just uh, define keys and uh, just see if it actually starts. Let's just do keyboard. God, it's years since I played this. Yeah, I think that's working. Well, I know that's working. Pretty hard. I remember this. What I never got about this is how it fits in with the film. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it, has it? All these prams and stuff flying around. I'm even firing rockets at you. I don't remember that in the movie. Yeah, the interesting thing is, it's the same as the other side of the disc. In that two of the games work, the first ones. The other ones don't. It could be that it's messed the heads up again. That's one possibility. You know, you put a new disc in. You may have to clean your heads. I did find that. On the CPC and on this one, actually, you know, you test with one disc, it works right. You put a disc in, suddenly no discs are working. You clean the heads again, both discs work. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, and when I say it doesn't work, you know, it can affect the heads where you can read uh, some stuff and not others. Try Green Beret again. But this uh, just bombed a minute ago, as did the mutants. Looks like it's worked well, it sort of started to work this time. That makes me think there's some dirt coming off onto the heads here. So I'm going to clean the heads up again. Well, aside from the fact that's as fuzzy as anything, hang on, I'm going to try and make out a bit better. RF cable is a bit loose. I got it working and I cleaned the disc. All I did is use a dry cotton, but let me show you. So you can see it's going dark here. I'm just using my phone to illuminate this. What I did is I started it loading, I held the sponge up here. And then I, I touched a dry cotton bud very gently all the way up and down, up and down. I could hear, you know, the disc spinning and I just wiped over it. Just flipped the disc over, did the same thing on the other side. And uh, lo and behold, that game has worked. I spent 10 minutes trying to get that game working. It wouldn't load at all, but it's loaded first time after doing that. So I think there was some contamination on the disc surface. Let's try the third game on that side. If this one works, that technique is uh, really good. But bear in mind, it's hard to do that uh, outside of the drive because the shutter protects it. And trying to rotate it at the same time is where the difficulty lies. So let's wait for the menu. It does take a while to come up on that side, I've noticed. But it does get there. There we go, let's try Green Beret. Now if this works, I'll be very happy. Now, that's got some sort of corruption, you can see here. So I'll flip the disc over and I'm going to try the games on the other side. Because there's a chance some of those may work now. We've now got one extra game working, that makes three out of six I think. So if uh, one or two of these work on this side, again I'll be very pleased. So we had short circuit working, let's try Great Escape and then we'll try Yi Kung Fu. Yep, <laughs> there you go. That's two additional games that's fantastic i am really pleased with that and um, we'll just try number three what i might do is clean the other side again just in case because one side got more of a clean than the other actually so yeah kung fu is it gonna work is it not no that's bond as well it's interesting we've got some progress there but we haven't completely solved it so I'm going to give each side another clean again, just gently. As I say, I've got a dry, clean cotton bud here. So I'm preparing by lifting that up. And then I need to return over the other side here. I want to load the loader. And how's it going? Right, so spinning. And I'm just going to touch the desk here. Oh, hang on. It's hard because the head starts moving. Just touch it gently and move across like that, nice and slow. Don't put too much pressure on. Right, let's put that down gently. Don't let it flap into the disc. Uh, and we'll cycle the power. I'm just going to give that another try now. So I'll try number three again, Green Barret. It's probably going to bomb again. Oh, got a different behaviour this time. A different behaviour. Could mean we've made it worse. Well, I'll try the second game again just to be sure. I haven't made it any worse. Yeah, that's working still. So we haven't made it any worse. I'll try the same on the other side of the disc now. Well, you're gonna like this, not a lot, but how I solved that and got uh, Green Beret working 
I added a tiny little bit of soapy water, so I mean like it's like 90% water, 10%, probably even less than 10%, 5% washing up liquid. And uh, went over it with that, you know, so let it rotate, the disc spinning round, cotton bud slowly up and down, you can see it's got a wet surface, use the dry end and you start to dry it. Now you do have to go up and down four or five, six, seven times with the dry ends, because you see little streaks of wet, you know, damp bits, and then eventually you start getting totally dry. I've tried it, works first time. So that disc needed the clean, it's got me wondering if I can get my Robocop working the same way. Now what I would say, do not use IPA, don't use IPA. People on forums go, oh you can clean them with IPA, just use a cotton bud and be a bit gentle with it. I found personally that three or four times in the past, going years back and recently, discs I've cleaned with IPA, it doesn't solve it, it makes it worse and then you can't read the disc at all. So uh, anyway, that seems to work. Let's try and start this. Let's just do keyboard. Hang on. Up, down, left, right, stab, shoot. Happy, yes. But you, you saw this wasn't working. And it's working. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. That should now mean that three games on that side work. It's just the third game on the other side we need to try and get working. There we go, Ya Kung Fu works as well. So I am very pleased, that's six out of six games working on this disc now. It's funny how we started with one on each side, we went up to two on each side, and then after using some soapy water to clean the disc itself, we got three on each side. He's gonna be so pleased. That's six out of six games. I'm gonna flip it over, and we're gonna try the third game on the other side again, which was uh, Green Beret. My man went blank there. I literally had to wait a minute while it loaded before I could see what it was called. Anyway, if this works, that is six out of six and it's loaded again. That's worked, fantastic. I know it looks like it's corrupted. Trust me, it's not. That's just the RF. So I don't have an RGB lead for this and it doesn't output composite. Uh, the plus two does, the plus three doesn't. Now, so what I'm gonna do is just do a couple of quick films here of it being really fuzzy on the TV, but you should be able to hear how bad the sound is. It is distorted. But you can hear here, it's clipping, it's distorted. Just listen when the main uh, theme starts in a sec, just give it a few seconds. There. That is well distorted. So this one's a mutant. And there's Operation Wolf. God, that sounds terrible. Let's just start it. Wow, that sounds awful. Really, really awful. Let me try some of the games here. Let me load Robocop. That's got some good music at the beginning of it. That's Robocop 2. It sounds like it's in a biscuit tin or something, or underwater. I think regardless of the tuning on the TV here, the fact it's coming over RF, I think that's going to be better when I've swapped the resistors out. So there are several resistors that need to come off here. The first ones are up here, is these two here, R42 and R43. So I will flip the board over and uh, remove these. So I won't uh, bore you with every single one of these, I'm just going to remove these first ones and then I'll zoom through the others and just show you uh, as I've done them. What I need to do here is try and bend this pin over if I can because it's kind of flattened on the board. If I heat it and just push it gently, there we go, I've strained it out somewhat. Have another go at that. Yeah, there we go. 
Uh, let's have a go at the other side as well. So again, I'm just going to heat it and then try and push it straight. That's not too bad. And then from the side here now, I can just try and uh, wiggle it a little bit. There we go, it's coming out, look. You don't want to pull it if there's solder there. Give it another uh, desolder. And in fact there is on that side, so if one side's out, one side is still in. So what I'll try and do here is... So we'll just try and uh, heat it. And uh, there we go, it snaps off the edge there. There we go, it's free. There we go, that's one out. So that's our 43. Let's do the one next to it. So we want a 1K2 first of all, so I'm just gonna bend the legs approximately. Just leave it a little bit of a gap on the end there, you know, to accommodate. And then, and then feed it into the position for R40. Hang on. Yeah, this is R42, so that's the inside one we're doing first. Now what you can do is just uh, pull it into position here. There we go, that should be nice and straight now. And bend the legs over just a little bit. So you can see that's our first one there. We just need to just solder it in. And I'll cut the extended legs off. So, so far we've got a 1K2 there, a 5K6 there, and we've just removed our 62 here, which needs to be 1K5. So we've put a 2K2 there in R63, and a 15K in R67. So then you have 820 ohm there, the third resistor up. And, and 6k8 for that one there and then flipping the board over you've got the joystick pause here if you look where this little uh, inductor thing is here it might be a little transformer down there's a lot of uh, connections on that there's a point there where one of the transistor leg comes out a 10k resistor to ground which is the area here I think um, so yeah that's the straightforward obviously I need to clean the flux off just one more resistor to go on and then go test it and the last one, we need to remove TR5, which is here, and bend its emitter leg up, fit it again, so only the base and collector are fitted, and then where the emitter went, we stick the resistor and feed it to the emitter pin on the transistor, so it's in series with the emitter, effectively. So you could look up uh, a data sheet or something for this transistor here. I'm going to cheap out by just using my component tester that came from Alice and Chalice. And this will tell me where the emitter is. There you go, red is collector, green is base, blue is emitter. So uh, let's have a look. Yeah, so the emitter is the right hand pin as the part number is facing you there. So we just need to bend that leg upwards carefully. Kind of like that. So, as I say, the key here is to fit your resistor into the hole where the emitter went and then fit your transistor back in and join this leg here to there and there you go you can see I joined the resistor leg there to the emitter so that's it all done, I could go test it the other optional component which they recommend removing if you're not going to use the modulator I think is this cap here and I think, it'll be wrong, I think that's coupling the audio signal with the modulator but I want to leave that in place he can always just, if he wants to do it himself, he can always just snip one leg of this uh, brown capacitor here, yeah, uh, and just pull it away from the board a little bit so it's not only connected on one side, and that will do the same job if he wants to do that. But I think that will remove the audio from the modulator. So let's give that a try through uh, fuzzy vision here. It's obviously going to be nowhere near as clear as it would be connected up via RGB here, uh, and the sound as well, you know, the sound's going to have a little bit of distortion because of the modulator. Yeah, I can hear a difference already. Just wait for the main part of the melody to kick in because that's where it was really distorting before.
Yeah. That is hugely better. Massive difference. Yeah. Train mutants again. Yeah, that's much better. Miles better. That's just as I remember it sending on a plus two now. Yeah, noticeably different. So the final thing I've just done for your charge is replace these 100 microfarad caps here with brand new uh, low ESR Panasonics. That only leaves two 1 microfarads. I've ESR tested them, they're fine. They do read about 3.5 ohms-ish, but that's because they're in circuit and compared to the replacements I've got, they're about the same. It's a good job I decided to look at those three caps and swap them because look at that, 44, uh, and it's actually marked 100. I'll just test it one more time. Yeah, look at that, 45 microfarad. It's lost 50% of its uh, capacitance, so it has dried up or leaked, one of the two. I don't see any leakage on the board. This is one of the other ones, and you can hear the ding-ding, that means it's good, the ESR is good. So the grey ones, they're both like that, just slightly over 100, and they've got good ESR, but anyway, they've been swapped out. And as I say, there's just two one microfarads on there, and they're fine. So I got the motherboard back in, marked it up accordingly with a red dot there, just to indicate the tops of the caps that have uh, been replaced. As I said, there's only two, there might be three actually. Yeah, there's three. But I did test them, test them all, they're all all right. And the main thing you've got to remember is I'm not charging any profit or anything on this, not even any money for my time. And I've spent crazy hours working on this and the disc that we fixed. Uh, let's get that ribbon in there. I hate disconnecting and reconnecting these. The fewer times you do this, the better. Try and do all your work on the board, and then reconnect the keyboard up. And the final thing I will always do with these and CPCs as well is clean the head again before I stick the lid on because we've had discs in and out, in and out, in and out, testing all these old discs here and uh, yeah you just get some of that contamination coming off on there throughout your testing. That's it. So with that disc, I got the smallest little bit of super glue onto the very edge there and then just closed it. Did the same over there, wiped it dry and then I put it in front of my extractor fan where it's sucking air this way. Now I did that deliberately because you know what super glue is like. Super glue, you get vapours coming off it. So if you were to just leave that like that, the vapours may spread inside, may go onto the actual surface of the disc, which was the whole reason why I wiped off the excess. There was only a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit just in the very corners here. And put it in front of that fan. So that fan will be pulling, and it's, it extracts air pretty good, that fan actually. It would have been pulling air, you know, away from the disc if that makes sense uh, and then I just carefully after about 10 minutes just inspected it just to make sure it looks okay and it does and tested it and all six games work on there so my advice to Adam uh, well there's a few things here I couldn't get the right protect tabs back in so could you write on that as it is now possibly so you need to be careful of that I, I don't know whether when the holes covered whether it means you can write to it or if it, whether it's the inverse uh, you could always just stick a piece of sellotape over there if that was 
of the case uh, to protect it or likewise if you want to write to it and you need that whole block so you could just stick a bit of tape over there temporarily um, so my advice to Adam is to store this in a sleeve you know you can get those cardboard sleeves for these two uh, you know the CF2 discs can't you if you've got one get what uh, you know put it in that if you haven't stick it in uh, you know one of the other game boxes or something just to make sure it's protected whatever you do do not touch the surface uh, and I wouldn't clean it again uh, you shouldn't need to just testing and all six games do work on that disc after gluing it back together. Uh, CPC disk drive, the same drives you get in a Spectrum Plus uh, 3 as well. This was doing nothing. The LED was not coming on at all and it would just say, you know, no disk found kind of thing, retry abort, fail. And uh, it was just completely dead. And I thought, there must be something power related with this. Can you see here? I've bridged IC4, Q4. Q4 there. This Q3 here, Q4 there. It's an ICP, an integrated circuit protector fuse, basically. Uh, if I just uh, test on continuity, Q3 there, got short, that one's okay. This one now with the wire is okay. So all I've done, a solder wire across there that was open circuit. Um, and as soon as I did that, uh, switch it on. I'm going to show you. Watch the LED. See? And we get activity on the drive. It was doing nothing prior to that should do that this particular model so yeah that's all it was and of course the other issue you get with some of these is the metal part back here I'll post a link up there to that but I also discovered on two drives here the tension of the spring here pulling this down means that even with a really good belt it slows the RPM down a bit which causes it to just say you know bring up the retry uh, message saying it can't find uh, the disc kind of thing and uh, the clue that that's an issue is if you hold this up and try it you then find it reads it's this putting too much pressure on uh, so one thing you can do there that I've done on both of these is lift the metal thing here like this and try and bend it over a little bit and press it right down to bend it just slightly it's very hard to do but you'll find after you've done that a couple of times it's, it still feels about the same but actually it works it doesn't cause you any problems so yeah that's the problem ultimately it's probably the sponge here that is either worn a little bit or has some sort of uh, friction instead of being smooth. Now the final tip we'll give you before I wrap this video up is this drive here is working. This came from uh, a friend of mine, Yellow Belly, and uh, the belt that was on here, he said he'd replaced it, but it was pretty slack. I don't have a replacement belt, so I used an elastic band, and the elastic band was about that long, so I stretched it right out, it's quite tight. And it works perfectly, absolutely perfectly. I've used this for a number of hours. It's rock solid. I have a torque setting on the screwdriver, so when you get to the point where it won't go any further, just watch. It just slips. You can't actually go more than just enough to hold the thing together. Because you can break the threads on these really, really easily, just the same as you can on the CPC, which is probably no surprise because Amstrad will use the same manufacturer to manufacture these cases. These screws here, if you find you've lost the coating off the top, the black coating, just use a little bit of a black acrylic paint. I did that on my CPC. Uh, screws and they came up looking like new actually they were slightly corroded on the CPC so I've just used some soapy water here to clean the surface of this just gently this is obviously isn't a complete restore video here we just covered specific things within this video but other things you might want to do is take the keyboard to pieces you know clean up the keyboard completely clean all the keys individually etc Anyway, that's looking pretty good now, I think. So I'll post a link down below to the Audio Mod webpage. Right at the bottom of that page, there's a nice couple of samples done by Mark Fixer Stuff. 
So you might find a better video on Mark's channel for this, uh, you know, for the audio mod there. It's certainly worth visiting that web page and scrolling down to the bottom and listening to the audio comparison there of a before and after. Because he's done that using the 3.5mm socket. One thing I will say, after doing the modification, um, when I tested with headphones in that socket earlier, it was like really, really, really bad. Uh, it almost sounded like there was a missing channel as well, it sounded really weird. Nevertheless, after doing the audio mod to this, and I thought there was no sound coming out of that socket at all, and that's not the case. It's just slight, it's like lower level, it's like 50% less, it's like line level, you know. So you need to connect an amplifier up to use audio uh, from the back there, but it's only mono, mono anyway, it's only on one channel. Uh, you need a you know specific cable. Um, but it's crystal clear that I can tell, you know, if I listen to the headphones now, it doesn't sound distorted like it was before, and it doesn't sound like there was a missing channel. There wouldn't have been a missing channel what was probably happening is the filtering was so over the top and distorting it was cutting out certain sounds and stuff so uh, anyway it's perfect now uh, it would have been nice to have tested this with an RGB cable but the thing is this started with a can you swap a belt out for me this is this came from Adam, the guy who I sold that 48k Spectrum to, uh, and I did say to him at the time, look, if you ever have a problem with another system or something, if you ever need a repair, you know, get back in touch, no worries. And he contacted me and said, would you mind replacing the belt? Now at that point, I pointed him to earlier videos and said, look, here's an example. You can do it yourself if you want. I don't mind doing it if you want me to do it. And he came back and said, actually, I prefer you did it, actually. So uh, that's where it started with a belt replacement. But I noticed the audio problem, even with the, the, the terrible uh, RF output, I knew the sound was an issue on this. It sounded really distorted, so we fixed that as well. But it would have been nice to have seen this in RGB. It won't be the last time I look at a plus three, I'm sure. I might get one myself one day. Anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. Thanks to Adam for sending this to me. It'll be uh, winging its way back to you over the weekend. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next video.